All right, good morning, church. So I'll be your preacher this morning. Um, I was going to preach this afternoon, but I've been called in to preach this morning uh, in Sam's stead this morning. And this morning I'm going to preach on the topic of discipleship. Discipleship. Now, what is the meaning of disi- the word disciple, right? Which is part of that word discipleship. And I looked this up. Now, in the dictionary, it'll say something along these lines. It'll say, one who accepts and assists in spreading the doctrine of another, or one who follows another for the purpose of learning. So this is what we're going to be looking at today. And we know in the Bible, from the Gospels in particular, we know that there were disciples of John the Baptist, and there were also disciples of Jesus. So we're going to look at that. And before I launch into this sermon, I just want to make this really clear right from the start, that obviously there are some churches, there are some organisations out there that confuse discipleship with salvation, right? Now, in this church, we preach salvation by grace through faith, that it's not of works, that it, it's not of our own righteousness, it's not of our own deeds, it's not of our own efforts. And discipleship is all about how we ought to live. It's about following the doctrines of the Bible, holding them, teaching those doctrines to others. This is what discipleship's about. It's got nothing to do with salvation. And I'll make this clear too, right from the start, is that... You can be a disciple, meaning you can go to church, you can follow somebody, you could follow a particular preacher that's following, allegedly following Christ, but you yourself might not be saved. You know, it's possible to be a disciple and not be saved. And we're going to look at that in the Bible too. But Jesus had many followers, John the Baptist had many followers, many disciples, but not all of them were saved. They followed them from town to town and stayed with them, but... Not all of them were saved. So I just want to make that clear before I launch into this sermon because this topic of discipleship, it's all about how we ought to be living our Christian lives. So it's re- primarily, this is for those that are already saved. They've already believed the gospel, the right, true gospel. They've placed their faith on Jesus Christ. Now they've got the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, saved. Now they can do the works of God. So that's what we're looking at today. And we've just read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, But just quickly, we're going to go back into chapter 1, but in chapter 11, Paul makes this statement in verse 1, Paul the Apostle. He says, Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now, in essence, this is what discipleship is is about, right? It's, It's about following somebody that's following Christ. We can't physically follow Jesus today. He's not with us today. He's not leading us physically to show us the way. We're not sort of sitting down with him physically and and, and learning from him day by day. We've got his word, the word, the word of God. We've got the Holy Spirit to guide us. And we have other men of God to preach behind the pulpit. We've got our pastor, Pastor Sepulveda. You could could say that he's like our main disciple here at New Life Baptist Church, right? Because he he does, you know, most of the preaching, he does the primary work here behind the pulpit. Now, What I want to make clear, and the reason we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, if we go back there now, go to chapter 1, starting in verse... uh, Is it verse 1? I think I've got the wrong reference here. Go down to verse 10. Skip down to verse 10, chapter 1. Verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were ye baptized in the name of Paul? Now here... What Paul's targeting here in the Corinthian church, there's divisions that have arisen in the church because the the congregation have started putting men above the Lord. Like now, one but here's the thing, one of them says, I have Christ. But the contention there is, look, I'm a better follower than you because I'm following Jesus and you're following Apollos and you're following Paul. But what what's happening is they're putting some status on who they're following, right? And it becomes more about who they're following than about the doctrine, how they ought to be living, etc. So they're idolizing particular individuals. Now this can easily happen when you have some prominent men in church, you know, prominent preachers, people that gather a bit of a following, 
They might be powerful preachers, you know, they, they preach really good sermons. And what can happen sometimes is you can have individuals within churches that start promoting these individuals and putting them on a pedestal and putting them too high, right? And Paul, at the end of chapter 1, if you, if you skip right down to verse 31, he says that, according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Now, we ought to be glorying in the Lord, not taking pride in which person we're promoting or who we're, we're following. Because remember, Paul said, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. The emphasis is the Lord. So when we're in, being instructed by individuals, people, you know, Pastor Sepulveda, he's, he's got the authority in this church. When we're listening to him and learning th through the Bible, the doctrines, it's not about him. It's about the word of the Lord. It's about the doctrine. It's about how we ought to live. The emphasis should never be on who the, the preacher is, right? It's the message, right? It, and the danger, the danger of putting too much emphasis on the preacher or the person that's, that's preaching or delivering a message, they're human. They're human. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to falter at certain times. They're not perfect. They're going to make mistakes. And if they're elevated too highly in your own eyes, the way you perceive things, when they do falter or fall or make a mistake, you're, you're going to be, you might be, there's a danger of you becoming disheartened. There's a danger of you falling away from the Lord, forgetting about church. You know, I, I went to this church, but this pastor did this, and so I've given up on God altogether. There's a real risk and danger of that sort of stuff happening. And that's why, let him that glorieth glory in the Lord. So I want to make that clear when it comes to discipleship. Sure. You are going to naturally look up to certain individuals. You're going to get counsel or advice from particular individuals as they might preach from the Word. Some people are going to have a better understanding of God's Word than others. And you're going to you know, learn a lot more from them. And it's good to surround yourself with wise counsel, so long as it's coming from the Bible. Now, obviously, in church, we get discipled, pretty, like, as far as this term goes, we get discipled every Wednesday night and every Sunday. right? When we're in fellowship, when we're hearing God's Word being preached... We're learning. That's what we're coming to church for, is to learn. Prim that's the primary reason for coming to church. Getting together as a congregation and fellowshipping together is to hear the word of the Lord being preached and to learn. And in 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 16, it reads, you know, and, and here's the thing. So if you want to turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3, why is this important? Why is it important for us to turn up to church as much as we can? Why is it important to come on Wednesdays and Sundays? You know, and try and be here and, and not miss any of these sermons and what's being taught. And the reason it's important, in 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Listen to this, verse 17, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Unto all good works. And essentially, this is why we come to church to learn. So, and here, where it says perfect, it means complete. It's so that we can be complete as believers or become complete, become truly furnished, so that we can do all good works. Not some, not part, all. So there's a lot, look, this is a big book. <laughs> there's a lot of commandments. There's a lot of doctrine. There's a lot of things to learn, right? You could argue it could take a lifetime or even more. Even in our lifetimes, we're not, we'll, we'll never be sinless, We'll never get to that point. That's impossible. And that's why where it says here perfect, it means complete. And that means in knowledge and understanding of the doctrines of the Bible and how we ought to be living. And now if we turn to, if we have a look at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter, turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse 27. Now, for some context here, this is Paul the Apostle again, and he's speaking to the elders at the church in Ephesus, here in Acts chapter 20. And in verse 27, he, say, he says this, he says, For I have, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. All the counsel of God. And, and look, when it comes to discipleship, it's all of the counsel of God. Like all scripture, right? It's all scripture. It's for doctrine, for teaching, reproof, correction, training in righteousness. It's all of the Bible. We, in this church, we don't cherry pick stuff. We don't look through the Bible and go, see, I wonder, I don't want to, I know what Rob thinks about this and I know what Hayden thinks about this, so I'm going to avoid that topic. 
I won't put, you know, I'm, I'm just picking out random names here. I know that you guys love the Bible. I know you love the whole thing and there's not any part of it that you wouldn't enjoy. But I'm just using this as an example that there could be, you know, you can have some individuals that might be offended at a particular topic. For example, you know, and look, I know this is a sensitive t topic, but there could be women that have, you know, maybe they've had an abortion, right? And the pastor could be tempted to just not preach on that topic because somebody's going to get offended. Somebody's going to get hurt. No, we won't shy away from it. It's still going to be preached in love from the pulpit because it's, it's, a doctor, it's something that we need to be taught from the Bible. It's, it's important. It's scripture. Things that are done, they're done. They're, they're in the past. They've been forgiven. Jesus paid for all your sins on the cross. And, and this is why the whole council needs to be preached. And so there's not a single topic in the Bible that we'll ever be shied away from from behind the pulpit at New Life Baptist Church. And we know, you know, Pastor Kevin has preached a wide range of topics. And this is why it's important to turn up as much as you can, because you could miss one of these important topics, one of these important doctrines that's going to help you in your Christian life. And like I said, it's a big book. <laughs> so it's going to take a long time to learn all these doctrines. Right? And I remember when I first got saved, we're all different, but I know for me, when I, when I was first saved about seven, eight years ago now, I couldn't get enough scripture. I couldn't get enough sermons or doctrine. I was just feasting on the Word of God because I just wanted to get as much in as I possibly could, learn as much as I possibly could. And I loved it. I love the Word of God. I love it. I, I couldn't get enough of it. But, he, but here's the thing. You don't want to fall into a trap where it's like, you think you've learnt everything now. You've feasted on the Word of God. You've been to, you know, hundreds of services or you've listened to hundreds of sermons online and you've filled yourself with doctrine and now you've got it all worked out. No, there's always, there's always going to be something for you to learn at church. There'll be somebody else that will be preaching from the pulpit that might have a different angle on certain things and you're going to pick something up. You're going to learn something that you might not have learnt from another preacher. So you can never get too much doctrine. Right, and, and you'll always learn something from the Word of God. Unless you're Jesus, you, you don't. There's things that you just won't be aware of. And as far as, you know, offending, like, and like I said, people will get offended. We've had visitors come in this church, and I, I can recall one coming in when, when Pastor Kevin was preaching from, I think it was Genesis 18, and, and it was about the Sodomites, and, and anyway, they've come in and it was a hard-hitting sermon. It was a hard-hitting sermon. And she never returned, right, after that sermon. Now, is it because she was offended at, you know, at Pastor Kevin preaching hard on that topic? Was it the delivery? Should he have been better with the delivery so that that person would come back next week? That's not what it is. And in John 7, 7, look, Jesus says this, the world cannot hate you. The world cannot hate you, but, it hateth, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. So Jesus is saying here to us that it, the world can't hate us. What he's saying is, sure, the world can hate us, but it's not because of us that it's hating us. It's because of Jesus. It's he, he's the one that testifies that the works thereof are evil. So when someone preaches, like Pastor Kevin, Genesis 18, or what, what, whatever the, the sermon topic is, sometimes it's going to step on some toes... But they're not really getting offended at the preacher. They're getting offended at God's word. This is Jesus. These are his words. This is what he's saying about certain sins, things that people ought not to be doing. And when you testify against certain sins that maybe hit close to home, somebody's going to get offended. But it's not because of the preacher. It's because of the word of God, which testifies that the works that are of are evil. And we're in Acts 20. Let's, keep, let's continue. Verse 28. So remember, again, the context is Paul talking to the elders at the, the church of Ephesus. And in verse 28, it says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all, this, all the flock over which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So this is a warning, like Paul's warning these elders in the church of Ephesus. 
you know, about teaching the whole counsel of God. Why? Because grievous wolves are going to come in. They're not going to spare the flock. All right now, we've, we've just had an incident down at um, Blessed Hope Baptist Church in Sydney where two men underwent church discipline. Right now, they were, they were guilty of undermining the pastor, like Pastor Sepulveda, by using railing accusations. Railing accusations. Now, I, I don't, look, I don't know if these two men are wolves. I don't know. But what I do know is this, that they're under church discipline. I can name them because they've been publicly rebuked now. And that's David and Luke. So they're under church discipline. Like I said, I don't know if they're wolves. But where it says here, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them, that's exactly what they did. They undermined the pastor by going to members of the congregation, speaking badly about him, trying to get them to listen to them, sympathise with them, draw them away from the pastor so they could have some sort of control, manipulate, have authority, try and ter- turn the congregation against the pastor. That's wicked. That is so wicked. Right? And this is why they were kicked out. And when it comes to pastoral authority, because we're talking about discipleship here, let's go to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. Actually, sorry, you go to first, sorry, first Thessalonians first. First, first Thessalonians chapter 5. Because the past, our pastor, Kevin Sepulveda, in our local church here, he has the authority in this church. He makes the decisions. And we, we, we need to submit to him, submit to his authority. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. Now here, admonish means to warn or, or reprimand or rebuke, right? And sometimes the pastor does have to rebuke someone. Now in the case of David and Luke, it was very public, right? It became very public because they wouldn't listen to the pastor. So it had to go public. And verse 13, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. And in Hebrews 13 verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch for your souls as they that must give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. So we ought to make it easy for Pastor Kevin to teach us so we learn from him and not make his job difficult. Right now, I, I don't think that's an issue with our congregation here. I think all of us are quite submissive to our pastor's leadership. We certainly haven't had the issues here that they've had down in, in Blessed Hope Baptist Church. And, and amen, amen. But the, in the, you know, the topic here is discipleship and we ought to make it easy for him to, quote unquote, disciple us so that we can learn, right? And, and look, there, there is no fun, there is no joy in having someone under you that won't submit, that becomes obnoxious, proud and just, you know, arrogant, uh, troublemakers, right? they, they cause trouble and it's not a joy for the pastor to have those sorts of individuals under him. Now hopefully when you do get, you know, you can, especially if you've got a new believer in the church that's just, you know, attending, they're saved but they might not have learnt to have, you know, the level of maturity that some of you have and it might take them some time, right? I mean I know what I was like when I first got saved, you know, I was, I was very zealous but I needed some more guidance and I needed to learn how to be properly submissive and, you know, really keep myself in line, right? And it, it takes time. So for some of us, it might take a while. Others might learn this quite quickly, depending on their, their, their nature. But this is what discipleship's about. And if you turn up to church every Wednesday, every Sunday, you're going to learn this a lot quicker and, you, 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 you know, you'll become more humble much faster than if you skip church or you only occasionally attend, Right? And those that the Lord, let's go to Matthew chapter 20, Matthew chapter 20, because now we're going to, we're going to sort of look at, well, how, how should, you know, those that are in authority behave? How should they behave? Matthew chapter 20. So those that, you know, are, are discipling us, how should they be? Matthew chapter 20, verse 25. So this is this here for some context. You know, James and John have just asked the Lord if they can, you know, sit at his right and left hand, 
right? And when you think about that, it's like it's a position of authority, right? You know, at the right hand and left hand of the Lord, they, they're seeking some authority here as a reward. You know, can you give us this, these positions, right? Now, Jesus makes it super clear, starting in verse 25, about what their motive should be. If they want that position, they want that sort of authority, what should their motive be? Why should they want it? Verse 25, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them, but it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Positions of authority, biblical authority, are positions where people become servants, not overlords. Right? Like, Pastor Kevin is not an overlord. He's a humble servant for the Lord. And that's why we ought to make his job easy by being submissive, right? So he can disciple us properly, so that we can learn. But there's churches and there's organisations out there that they don't practice this. They don't practice this principle of being a servant. They do become overlords and, you know, quite manipulative and controlling in the way that they run things sometimes, run their organisation or run a church. Right? And that it shouldn't be so among us. Right? So if you're somebody that does desire you know, to be a pastor or a deacon, then what you're also desiring to do is be a humble servant for the Lord. It's not about having power over people. It's about serving and loving others. That's what a good shepherd is. And I, I thank God that we've got a good shepherd in Pastor Kevin here at New Life Baptist Church. We really do. Now, let's look at Jesus and the following that he had. Let's go to John chapter 6. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 6. Because we know Jesus had the 12. Like he had his 12 disciples. And a lot of the focus is on those 12 throughout the gospel. The gospels, right? Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And in John chapter 6, in verse 2, so in verse 2, it says, And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Right, so Jesus has been performing a lot of miracles, healing a lot of sick people. And because of this, and they're seeing the miracles, he starts getting a really big following. Right, there's a lot of people, crowds that just start following him around. Right, now in John chapter 6, he preaches pretty hard here in John chapter 6 and he ends up offending a lot of people here in John chapter 6. And then if we skip down to verse 26, it says this, Jesus answered them, so this is the same crowd following him, answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. So back in verse 2, they're following him because of the miracles, right? <laughs> It's like, wow, this is amazing. This must be of God. Let's, let's follow this man. Let's hear what he's got to say. Then he feeds the 5,000, right? Now down in verse 26, they're not following him because of the miracles anymore. They're following him because he can, they want a free feed. <laughs> Their motives, right, have become wrong. It's like, let's keep following Jesus so we can just get a free feed. And this is, it's sad, but this is just the reality, right? This is the reality. Now, what unfolds here shows us what Jesus wants in his followers, those that are truly devout and those that really want to follow him. Because do you really think Jesus wants a large following? Or does he want a small following of devout believers, those devoted to him? He would much prefer a small following of devoted believers than just a large crowd, right? And, and, and look, think about... Think about how, like today, with some of these preachers like Benny Hinn or, you know, Joel Osteen, these false teachers, they love a big crowd, don't they? They love a massive audience, a massive crowd. You know, it looks, it's a bit of a spectacle. And also it's like, hey, look at me. Look how many people I've got following me, right? Jesus is the opposite, right? And we're about to see this because he's not about having a circus. 
He's not a clown that's part of a circus with a big following, like Joel Osteen, Benny Hinn, these guys. They are clowns, absolute clowns. They don't care about whether you're devoted to Jesus. All they care about is having a big crowd and a big audience. Now, what we're going to see here, if you go down to verse 61, now this is after, you know, he's fed the 5,000, he's exposed sort of their motive, a lot, the motives of a lot of them, why they're following him, because they want a free feed. And then he goes through this teaching on, you know, eating his flesh, drinking his blood, like he's equating the bread, himself as the bread of life. Hey, look, don't go after the bread of this world, go after me, I'm the bread of life, this is Jesus, and that's what he wants, he wants them to be devoted to him. He wants them to be consumed by him, like learning from him. That should be their motive. But in verse 61, it says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Why? Because it's no longer about a free feed. Now it's about being devoted to Jesus, right? Eating of him, eating of his flesh, drinking of his blood, which means learning from him, taking on from him. And then down, uh, sorry, not 61, sorry, that was verse 66. My bad. I think that was verse 66. Let's turn there. I might have the wrong reference here. John chapter 6. Yeah, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then, in verse 67, now picture this. He's got a a big following here, big crowd following him. A lot of them turn back. They no longer want to follow him. Now, do you think Jesus is going to be like, Whoa, 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 don't go, don't go, stay. No, you know what he does? In verse 67, he says, Then Jesus said unto the twelve, Will you also go away? Like, you can go if you want. You're free to leave. He's not forcing anybody to stay with him. When it comes to discipleship, it's not about force. It's not about manipulating others to follow you. It's not about, you better do this or else. You're free to come and go. You're free to come and go. Now, I, I preached a sermon, it was more, t- more than two years ago now, about the International Church of Christ. I preached a sermon against that church. And what they do with their discipleship program is, they, they, you've got to be a disciple to be saved, and you've got to do the works for your entire life or you'll lose your salvation. And the manipulation and threats and control mechanism that they use is, You can't leave us or you're going to go to hell, right? That's not what Jesus is doing here. These people are just free to go. It's your choice if you want to attend church, right? Now, it's a commandment in the Bible, you should attend. Like, you you better attend. Like, that's a commandment. You need to attend church. But you've still got free will and it's got nothing to do with going to heaven or hell. That's fully paid for by Jesus Christ the moment that you placed your faith in him. Church attendance or non-attendance has no bearing on your salvation. And here, these, these people had that decision. Do I want to follow Jesus or not? He doesn't force them. He's not begging them to stay. Whereas the cults of this world, you know, these false teachers and false brethren and or, false organisations, they do use methods of manipulation and control to try and tell you that you've got to stay with us. You're, you, you, you'll go to hell if you leave us. And there's a lot of them out there. There's a lot of them. It's not, that's not discipleship. Verse 68. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. And we believe and assure that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for it was... For he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Here's Judas' chance to go. <laughs> Jesus couldn't even be more direct. Can you imagine? Judas is standing there listening to this. He might have been like, like this, as Jesus is saying this, knowing that it's him. right? But here's his big chance to just go. And this is the thing about the wolves. They're very brazen. Even being directly confronted like this, He's talking to the twelve, one of you is a devil, Judas stays. This is pretty early in Jesus' ministry here. He doesn't go anywhere, he stays there. They're brazen. The wolves are brazen. 
So we just be aware of that. Like, and, and I read earlier, you know, about Paul warning about these wolves that, you know, will come in and not spare the flock. And, and they're, they're so brazen. They're incredibly brazen. You can have hard-hitting sermons from the pulpit that are directly, you know, directed at these sorts of individuals, these false brethren that are unsaved and they're here for an agenda, an ulterior motive. They'll stick around. Until they're, until they're exposed, they will stick around. Now, notice Jesus here. He didn't point out to the 12 and say, it's Judas. Now, he could have, but he didn't do that because Judas had a job to do. He had to betray the Son of God. He had to betray the Son of Man. And we know how that unfolds and Jesus had to go to the cross and die for the sins of the whole world. So that had to take place and, and Jesus knew that that would happen. And that's, this is why he's got Judas in there. Now let's turn to Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. So just to recap on that, it, it, discipleship, it's, it's, it's your choice. Right? As a believer, it's your choice on how much you want to learn, how much you, know, you want to devote your life to the Lord, how sacrificial you want to be. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 20 reads, Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. There are many devices in man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord that shall stand. You know, particularly for the children in the church, this, this proverb, hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. If you're one that can humble yourself, learn, and you'll be wise. You'll really benefit in the end. Now, I'm an older man now, I'm, I'm 44. I wish I was saved at a younger age and I wish that I could have had this kind of learning when I was, I was younger and could have avoided a lot of mistakes in my life and really bad decisions but you know praise God for you young people here that you can learn these things early in life and avoid a lot of the pitfalls that some of us have have endured throughout our lives unnecessarily unnecessarily you know and what I want to discuss here is advice versus commandments advice versus commandments because you can get advice and you can get counsel from wise wise people right and they can give you some godly advice some godly counsel and if somebody is giving you godly counsel then it's coming from the word of the lord right but sometimes you'll get advice that's not necessarily you know there might be something in life that might not necessarily be to do with some of the commandments that are in the bible and it's just advice right it's just advice it's not a pastor's job when you ask for advice to say you better do this or else Right? Unless, it's, unless you're going to go into some sort of sin that's going against the Bible, well then, yeah, he'll, he'll tell you plainly that that's sinful. But if it's something that's not sinful and it's just some advice that you're getting, then all it is is just advice. You're free to take it or you're free to let it go. But when it comes to the commandments, that's different. Like, if you wanted to engage in some sinful act, then, yeah, the pastor's going to tell you, it's, he's going to tell you that's sinful. And he'll show you the verse and go, look, this is why. Right? But there's a big difference between taking advice or giving advice and commandments. And look, the cult groups out there, they love to th have the advice in with the commandments and, like, and, and, and it's almost like their words are the words of God rather than the Bible at times with some of these cult groups. And that's what you want to watch out for. Um, because the pastor's authority is limited to the church itself. It doesn't go beyond that. It doesn't go outside the church. Um, the, the pastor, for example, cannot tell you who you can and cannot marry, for example, right? Now, here's the thing. If you want to avoid a lot of grief in life, marry a believer, right? But the pastor can't force you to do that. That's your decision. Now, if you've listened to some wise counsel and you've heard some instruction from the Bible, you'll know that that's a really bad idea to marry an unbeliever. And just on this, when it comes to commandments... Um, for example, you can have, we can have a new believer that comes into the church and they might be living with their girlfriend or it might be a girl living with her boyfriend. Now, we'll have some grace. We'll give them some time. But when it comes to the serious commandments and serious sins, like fornication, for example, if they don't change their ways, they will be kicked out of the church 
in that example because that's a serious sin. Fornication is a serious sin. It's enough to get you kicked out of the church. The two men that were disciplined down in Blessed Hope Baptist Church, Luke and David, they were disciplined on railing. That's a sin that can get you kicked out of church. False accusations. Now, in their case, it was false accusations against the elder, against pastor supporter. So, serious sin and these sorts of commandments, you know, they're, they're things that, you know, when it comes to the pastor's authority, he has the authority to kick you out of the church when you're engaged in those sins. Now, if you're not engaged, here's the list here. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, which is fornication, covetousness, idolater, idolatry, railing and drunkenness or being an extortioner. If you're engaged in any of those particular sins consist, and it's consistent and you're unrepentant, yeah, the pastor can kick you out of the church. Now, when it comes to other sins that are not listed here, you could be engaged in those and you won't get kicked out of church. And it would be beyond the pastor's authority to actually kick you out of the church if you're engaged in some other sin. Now, hopefully through discipleship, coming to church every Wednesday and Sunday, you're going to start eradicating those sins out of your life and you'll become a better Christian, but you won't be kicked out of church. And if a pastor was to kick you out of church for sins that are not in that particular list there, he's out of bounds. He's overstepped the mark. It's, it's like... And, and look, there are pastors that sometimes, unfortunately, want to be too involved in people's lives to the point where they stick their nose in things that they really shouldn't be. And I'll give you an example. Like, it could be a, a marriage, husband and wife, you know, and the pastor gets in the middle there and just starts telling one thing to one per, you know, the wife or the husband, for example. Now, pastor's pulpit doesn't do any of this. Like, when it comes to marriage counselling, it's like, he'll, he'll probably point you to one of the sermons where he's preached on marriage, you know, how husbands ought to treat their wives and how wives ought to submit to their husbands. He'll, he'll, pre- he'll point to his sermons or at the very least he'll show you some verses from scripture. Like if you go to him and approach him and say, hey, I need some help in my marriage, it'll be all from here. But he won't be sort of sticking his nose in your marriage, for example, and, you know, getting down into the nitty gritty and that sort of thing. That's not his place. It's, it's the, the husband's job to, to rule the house. It's the, the wife's job to guide the house. That's, that's on them. You know, they've got the Holy Spirit to guide them. They've got the Word of God. Come to church every Wednesday and Sunday and you'll learn how to have a good marriage. Now, here's the thing. If you miss a church service, you might miss that sermon on marriage. And that's why it's important. You should attend all church services because you might miss something super important. But that's the difference between, you know, advice and commandments from the Bible. So when it comes to discipleship, it's really important to separate that um, because... Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't have somebody controlling or manipulating your life that's outside of those bounds, right? It's not their place. And I've experienced it. That church I came from down in Melbourne, the International Church of Christ, they were horrendous on this sort of stuff. Horrendous. They directed pretty much every aspect of my life. It was ridiculous. Ridiculous. So let's go to Luke chapter 14, verse 33. And we're going to look at what it required, what it took to be a disciple of Jesus back in the day. Luke chapter 14, 33. And we can draw a principle from this. We can draw a good principle from this. Luke 14, verse 33. Jesus says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Jesus just flat out says here, if you don't forsake everything, you can't be my disciple. The primary application for this is if you wanted to be a follower of Jesus then, 2,000 years ago, you had to forsake everything. You had to leave behind, if you were married, your wife, your children, your house, your job, everything. You had to forsake everything. And you think, how can that be? That's too hard. Jesus' ministry moved from town to town. That's how it was. If you wanted to be a disciple and his follower, you had to be prepared to be on the move all the time. And to back this up, just quickly, because I don't want to spend too much time on this particular point, but Luke chapter 8, verse 67, if you want to turn there. Luke chapter 8, verse 67. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. 
And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. So here, before we continue, I'll park it there. Jesus is making it clear here that the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, meaning he's never going to be in the same spot. He's always on the move. Right? And he's making it clear here that this, to this man who says, I'll go wherever thou goest, well, are you prepared to go everywhere that I go? And we're not stopping, we're not staying anywhere for any lengthy period of time. Verse 59, and he said unto another, follow me. So this is Jesus asking someone to follow him. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus said unto him, let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Now notice this, Jesus is actually asking this particular individual to follow him, right? And, and think back early in Jesus' ministry, one of the first things Jesus said is, come follow me and I'll make you fishers of men, right? And, and Jesus' primary mission was to seek and save the lost. But, but here he's, he's, he's picked out a p- particular individual, asked him to follow him, and the guy's like, I've got something really important that I've got to take care of first, and it is a serious matter. His father's died. He wants to bury his dad, give him a proper funeral, give him a proper send-off. And Jesus is like, let the dead bury their dead. Now notice this, after Jesus has said, come follow me, and then this man has this sort of excuse, something that he has to do first, Jesus says, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. So now, instead of Jesus saying, come follow me, it's like, okay, I had this in mind for you, I know that you're saved, but just go and preach the kingdom of God. Because he's not going to follow Jesus. Why? He's got other important matters to take care of. Verse 61, And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid them farewell, which are at at home in my my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plough and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Wow. That's confronting. That is just so confronting. And here's the thing, and the principles we can take away from this, because we're not going to physically follow Jesus today, Like he said to his disciples, you know, you'll not always have me, right? And we don't have Jesus with us physically. But the principle we can take away from this is once you put your hand to the plough, once you've, you know, you're committed, and once you've learnt to become a soul winner, right, and you're winning souls for the Lord, don't you ever stop. Don't ever stop doing that because, uh, you know, uh, the danger here is that once you've put your hand to the plough, if you take it off and just forsake it for a you know, lengthy period of time and just don't want to do it anymore, well, you're not fit for the kingdom of God, right? The Lord might no longer have a use for you if that's what you end up doing. So you don't want to make, make that mistake. So when it comes to discipleship, in this strict interpretation, right, like with this strict primary application here when it was for these disciples back in Jesus' day, we're not disciples of Pastor Sepulveda to the level that these were disciples of Jesus Christ, right? Because think about this, right now our pastor is flying between the Sunshine Coast and Sydney almost on a weekly basis. You know what that would require of us? You'd have to get on the plane every week, fly down to Sydney, fly back. Now they didn't have aircraft (laughs) back in those times, but they walked, they did a lot of walking but if that's what the equivalent would be, we'd, we'd have, you'd have to hop on that plane and travel down there, travel back. That would get tiring. I, I don't envy Pastor Sepulveda at all of having to do that. That would get tiring really quick. But that's, that would be the equivalent. So you couldn't, I couldn't say I'm a disciple of Pastor Sepulveda. You know, I follow him wherever I go, right, in that context, right? But we can draw the principles of what it means to be a follower of Jesus in our day and age and it's it's up to you what sort of level of commitment you want to make it's it's up to you it's up to you when you count the cost what are you prepared to do for the Lord what are you prepared to do let's turn to Acts chapter 1 we're just looking at one verse here because let's, let's think about it like with Jesus ministry right he preached and teached to thousands. He healed thousands, like hundreds probably, if not thousands of people he healed. He fed thousands and thousands of people using miracles, just creating bread and fish, you know, increasing the amount of bread and fish by miracle. 
he did all these wonderful things. He, he preached to thousands. But at the end of it all, at the end of it all, in Acts chapter 1, verse 15, how many devoted followers were left at the end of his ministry? How many are there with Peter? Acts chapter 1, verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. There's only 120 men. 120 followers. After all that ministry, the preaching, the teaching, thousands and thousands being saved, there's only 120 devoted followers here. And this, it gives you a bit of an indicator of, you know, how many devoted followers of Jesus on a, on a ratio or a percentage sort of basis, really. And we get, in the, our church, we go out and we do a lot of soul winning. We do a lot of door-to-door soul winning. We preach to a lot. We do see souls being saved, but not many of them turning up to church, right? We, that's, that's the reality. That's what, what we see, right? And it's because when you look at this... Now, and here's the thing. We're not even as devoted as what these men were, right? These were fully devoted. They'd given up everything. To attend church the way we do and just go out soul winning, you know, we don't go out every day. We're not doing what these guys were doing. But even then, it's still only a small percentage that turn up and commit themselves, right? You know, it, it seems to be the case that when we get visitors and they hear sermons and they might hear sermons on soul winning, you know, preaching the gospel, and they might be intimidated. They might be like, oh, that's too much for me. This isn't the church for me. I'll, I'll go somewhere else, right? And this is the reality, right? It's just, and Jesus, like I said earlier, Jesus' primary mission was to seek and save the lost and to teach others to do the same. And as a church, that's what we ought to be doing. The primary mission for us is to seek and save the lost. So all the doctrine we learn, you know, how we ought to be living and eradicating sin out of our life and learning the whole counsel of God, the ultimate goal with all of this for you to grow in the Lord is to seek and save the lost. It's to see souls being saved. You know, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and he that wins souls is wise. And if the church, look, here's the thing, if the church is not teaching believers to preach the gospel, then it's lost its first love. It's no longer doing the first works. It's such an incredibly important ministry. Now, um, Pastor Stevenson preached a sermon recently on, you know, the Lord being pleased with churches that go through um, tribulation. It was a, it was a good sermon. Um, and... Uh, Here's the thing, a church will go through a lot of tribulation when it's preaching the gospel a lot. That's what draws a lot of tribulation, right? And, and when you think about it, and look, I, I know this from personal experience. So before the church started here, I'd, I'd like to share a story actually. When, I, when the church, so we, th- this church has been going for what, three years? Nearly three years? Before, before that, um, I was out preaching the gospel with a friend of mine at the time and I'd been looking for a decent church in the local area. Uh, trying really hard, getting frustrated. I, ideally, I was looking for a, cer- a church that, you know, preached from the King James Bible, um, had the right gospel. And even if they weren't soul winning, I was prepared to go soul winning anyway. But I was, that's the sort of church I was looking for. And I had no real success. Uh, my wife, at the time, she had started going to Kiwana Life Baptist Church. And I went maybe once or twice. They were preaching from the NIV. It was just too liberal and watered down. But we were desperate. You know, we were just trying to find a church. And at that time, I'm out soul winning with my friend. And it just so happens that when I'm out soul winning, we encounter... One of the houses, the doors that we knocked, ended up being the wife of one of the, the pastors at a, an Anglican church. And we tried, you know, we went through the presentation. You know, first of all, asked the question, you know, if you, if you died today, would you be 100% sure that your soul would go to heaven? Was gentle with her, patient, wanted to find out if she was saved, went through the gospel presentation. Now, my friend and I, we could, we could tell that she was getting really irritated by us. You could just tell from her body language because obviously us asking the, uh, these questions, she felt offended because she's the wife of the pastor. She's like, 
Of course I'm saved. I'm the wife of the pastor of an Anglican church. Anyway, we, through the presentation of the gospel, we discover that she's not saved. Right? And towards the end of that presentation, I told her that she wasn't saved and she lost it. She lost it. She got so angry at me. And I'm just using the Bible. I'm just showing her from the Bible why she's not saved. She was trusting in her own efforts, her own righteousness. She was self-righteous. She was self-righteous because she was trusting in her own efforts to get to heaven. And I, and I made that clear to her and I showed her various verses to prove from the scriptures why she wasn't saved. And I, I made the point with her. I said, look, I'm not telling you this because I want to offend you. I'm telling you this because I care about you and I want you to go to heaven. She didn't see it that way. Anyway, we continued knocking doors in the area for maybe another half an hour. And all of a sudden, this man just starts charging down the road at us. <laughs> and I look up and he was charging at us. He was angry. He was, he was really angry. Anyway, it turns out that this is the Anglican pastor. So this is the, the husband of the wife that we've just seriously offended, right? And, and this is going to happen. When you do enough door-to-door -door soul winning, these sorts of events will take place eventually, given enough time. And anyway, I just saw this as an opportunity to give the gospel to him as well. Because if she's not saved, I don't think he's going to be saved either. But we, I, you know, I gave him the benefit of the doubt when he approached us. First of all, we had to sort of try and calm him down a little bit and explain sort of exactly what we'd shown his wife from the Bible because he, he, was, he was like super angry. Anyway, he eventually calmed down enough that we had the opportunity to start going through our gospel presentation. Now, obviously how I've done that is I've tried to say to him, hey, look, can I just show you what we showed your wife? Can we do that, please? Just so you can see what we were doing. He allowed us to do that. I ended up presenting him the gospel. Now, he, he was very evasive, extremely evasive. Didn't want to answer any questions, didn't want to give any information on what he really believed. Super evasive. Anyway, remember I told you that Cindy was attending Kiwana Life Baptist Church? It turns out, Donnie, I can't remember, Donnie Johnson. So Donnie Johnson, who was the pastor at Kiwana Life Baptist Church at the time, was friends with this pastor at the Anglican Church. And Cindy was attending Kiwana Life Baptist Church. They talked, Donnie and this man, now I, I had no idea about this, but they talked and that Sunday, while my wife was sitting in the church, I wasn't there, started preaching about these two guys that were out door to door giving the gospel. Now do you think he talked about us in a good light or a bad light? It was in a bad light. It was in a very negative way. And instead of commending people that were going out door to door preaching the gospel, trying to get souls saved, he attacked us. He attacked myself. Now he didn't know that Cindy was my wife, sitting in the congregation, listening to the whole thing. And it was, I'll tell you this, it was a railing accusation because it was all false. Everything he was spewing from the pulpit was totally false. One of the things he said, so Cindy, the way she told me, is that when he started talking about the pulpit, one of the things he opened with was, look, it's come to my attention that some of you might not be sure, know if you're really saved or not. And look, if you've got you know, any, if you're unsure whether you're saved or not, please come and see me after the service. <laughs> so instead of making the doctrine of salvation clear from the pulpit, he's like, just come and see me after the service. And, and look, before I go on to the rest of this story, think about that. The reason he's doing this, he doesn't want to offend people in the church. He doesn't want to be black and white on the doctrine of salvation from the pulpit, because I can guarantee you there's probably people in the church that might, might actually be saved, and there'll be others that are trusting in their works and they're not saved. And he doesn't want to lose members of his church. So it's like, come and see me after the service. Because then if individuals do go see him after the service, he's only going to maybe lose one or two people if he tells them the truth, right? Instead of half the church. And this is why these guys hate to preach black and white from the pulpit. They can be very evasive, just like that cat, the, uh, the Anglican pastor was with me when I tried to present him the gospel. Just evasive, without giving direct answers. Anyway... Continuing on, he then goes on to start saying that, you know, these guys were going to the door to door and they were saying, you know, if, are you 100% sure that you're saved? Because if not, you're going to go to hell. Like, this is the, the way he's saying it. Like, just totally 
misrepresenting what we're doing going door to door. But as Jesus said, remember what Jesus said? He that is not gathering is scattering, right? And these guys that don't do door to door soul winning, like the Donnie Johnsons of the world, they scatter. They're not gathering. They're not saving souls for Christ. They're not going out door to door. They're scattering. They're attacking this kind of work. But this, for us, when we preach door to door, this is the kind of persecution that you should be facing every now and then. Not all the time. It's just, and I don't go looking for trouble. It just so happens that it found me on this day. And anyway, Cindy came, comes and she reports this to me. She tells me exactly what happened. And I'm like, I'm not going to let this go. I'm going to call Donnie Johnson. And I did. I called him. I asked him about what went down. Now, he didn't know I was Cindy's husband. And I said, hey, Donnie, I'm the one that went door-to-door soul winning. Have you heard my side of the story? Do you want to hear my side of the story? Do you want to hear my side of the events and what took place? We had a chat. Now, he completely backpedaled on the phone. He was completely different to how he'd presented it to his church. The man was a coward. And here's the thing, I can guarantee you this, he'll never go back to his church and preach from the pulpit about what he did was wrong by attacking the soul when we were doing door to door. He was apologetic on the phone to me, but he's not going to do that from his pulpit to the church because then he's got egg on his face. Right? But this is the kind of persecution that we should face. This is the kind of stuff that should happen when we're a soul winning church and we're out doing the works. Right? And it's a good thing. The Lord's pleased with us when we face sort of persecution or tribulation by, just, by doing these works. And just to sum up what we've looked at here today with um, discipleship is that being a disciple and, and learning and being committed with the church is, I, I can promise you this, it will bring persecution in your life. It's going to bring some tribulation, but it's worth it. A hundred percent, it's worth it. Because I'll tell you something, these sorts of experiences for me draw me closer to the Lord. They don't make me offended. I don't get offended at this sort of stuff. When, when I was speaking to Donnie, I didn't call Donnie because I was offended. I called Donnie to set him straight so he can preach the right thing to his congregation. Like that, no wonder we don't have many, many churches that go out soul winning when you've got guys that attack it like this. It's shameful. It's a disgrace. Anyway, I just want to end there just, just to sum it up. So when it comes to discipleship, that, you know, the primary application back then in Jesus' day was literally following Jesus and literally giving up all that you have to follow him. But for us today, it's about, you know, church attendance. It's not about following our pastor wherever he goes, okay? And it's about being committed and learning, coming to church and actually learning from what's being preached from behind the pulpit. Let's pray.